Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's another time when we gather together around God's word as we celebrate and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us begin before we turn to our sermon this morning and our instructions, and let us pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful. As we gather together today, we come to worship you. We come to lift you up. We come to take in your word, to be instructed by it, to be encouraged by it, to to be equipped by it so that we might be like Christ in all that we say, do, and are. Father, for those who are sick, we pray you are the great physician who heals. For those in need despair or grief, you are the great counselor who comforts according to your word. And for those who've lost their way, we pray that you would be the great shepherd of their souls and draw them back to your bosom. Guide us in your word today. Teach us what you would have us know. Convict and conform us to Christ-like character, conduct, and conversation. This we pray in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, and all God's children say together, Amen. So today, for this month, we're looking at the book of Genesis. We're just going to have a hit some of the highlights. It's good to get back to the basics of our belief system. It's good to review these basics from time to time. I'm reminded of that great football coach, Vince Lombardi. Every year when they would go into the training camps, you know, to prepare for the next football season, what Vince Lombardi would do, he would get, bring the team together and he would focus them on the fundamentals. He believed that if you do the fundamentals well, it becomes second nature. And that's how you build a winning team. So the first things he would say every year at training camp when the Green Bay Packers would gather together and lay the Redskins, as they were all gathered before they went out and did their calisthenics, he would hold up a football and say, Gentlemen, this is a football. So let's open our Bibles to the first verse in the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, which begins with, In the beginning, and the next word is God. Now, in many ancient religions and ancient civilizations, often the religion consists of many gods. And often in those accounts, when you study their mythology or their religion, they would have a story of how those gods came to be. In other words, these gods were not eternal, but created. Not so with our faith. There is God. He is unborn. He is uncreated. He is eternal. Time begins as we read this, these first four words, and God is already there. Now, the word God in Hebrew in this verse is Elohim, which is a plural. El, or El, is the word for God in Hebrew, in the singular. However, Elohim in the Hebrew Bible is not translated as God's in most instances. When it's speaking of our God, the one true God, is treated as a singular it is a revelation by God to the human instrument who penned down this revelation that had been passed down from Adam until Moses. Moses was the one moved by God to write this down. Up until that time, the word of God was an oral tradition, and the oral traditions of ancient peoples was that you had to learn to recite from memory exactly to include the proper inflections, the stories. So here we have a hint of the mystery and majesty of the Holy Trinity of God. And later in chapter 1 of verse 26, we find this again. And God, Elohim, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. There's another hint to the Holy Trinity of God. God being all-powerful and eternal is revealed in the beginning as created. So right after that, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the power to create something out of nothing belongs to God. We can only take what currently exists in this world and rework it into something else. Now there are types of rocks we call ore. And that type of rock you can heat up and it will melt some slag will come to the top, and then what's left is a substance like gold or silver or tin or copper and, and iron. And these are in turn forged into like bronze instruments, brass knobs, cast iron kettles, gold jewelry, 
silver necklaces. So all we're doing is taking something that already exists and just recreating it in something else. That's about as close as we can come to the image of God. So God calls into existence what looks like a watery lump of clay in the next verse. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. I just recently read an article in a journal someplace where God had, I mean, where scientists in Australia, they believe Australia's got one of the oldest stable geology in the world. And they came to a level of geology where they believe that one time this entire world was covered with water. And they also made mention that, 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 that what they saw sounds very much like this. Yet, at the same time, they also said, well, we know the world is older than a few thousand years, so ha, 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 ha. But they thought that was a great coincidence. Well, coincidence sometimes is God working and we don't see him. But we do know this. Matter has three forms. Solid, liquid, and gas. Okay? And it's all there. The earth was formed in darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. That means he was hovering in what we would call atmosphere, which is gas. So God, in the beginning, is creating the heavens and the earth, and creation is very personal to God. He was personally involved. So we, hear, we see that the Spirit of God hovering. He's there. He's there in person. God has a will, he has intellect, and he has purpose in what he does in creation. So here he is in the middle of the creative process with the spirit there. King David wrote Psalm 8 as he meditated on God's creation. He may have been reading Genesis chapter 1 when he writes these words. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? That's Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4. Out of all the vastness of the expansive universe, God set aside this tiny moat of mud for a special purpose. Many scientists who study the cosmos believe that our place in the universe is unique and is possibly the only place where life exists. And God made it personal. And in fact, there is a um, video that was produced by a group of scientists who believe in the intellectual design and they make a case that this may be the only place in the universe where we could possibly exist. Because they say if our planet was closer to the center of the Milky Way, there would be no night, for example. It would be bright all the time. It would be too bright in the daytime. It might even be too hot to live. And speaking of that, where we rotate around the sun, the distance from the sun, is the right distance for life to exist on this planet. If, we get, if you get further away from the sun, we'll be just a frozen planet. If we get closer, then it will be a molten planet. I mean, between the two, you know, we, we're in the right distance from the sun for life to exist in where there's a proper mixture of solid, gas, and uh, liquid so that life could be formed. And there's more I could say, but let's move on. In creating the heavens and the earth, not only we have, did God make it personal, he is the power. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Light is energy. And darkness, remember this, darkness is the absence of the energy we call light. Now, Hollywood likes to promote the idea of the power of darkness. No, there's no power in darkness. You switch off the light, it's dark. So no more energy. Same thing with heat. Heat is energy, and cold is the absence of the energy we call heat. So you see this binary relationship. Energy exists. It's called one thing, like heat and light. When it doesn't exist, it's darkness and cold. Then there's also life and death. Life is a unique energy from God that allows us to live, and death is the absence of that energy. Life, light, and heat all come from God, 
And everything is crafted according to God's laws in this universe. I find it interesting to read John's gospel when you open, when you open it up. In the beginning was the word just like Genesis. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Doesn't that sound very familiar with what we have just read? John certainly was inspired to give us that wonderful opening statement to his gospel. The ultimate power is to cre create something out of nothing. How? Only God knows. God being eternal and all-knowing as has all the time of eternity past to develop the process. And this is the process, quite simple. He's already thought it through, because he's God. He's had all of eternity past to come up with this beautiful thing we call the universe. So God speaks, and things happen. And they all appear in an orderly fashion. If you read the rest of Genesis chapter 1, the process is revealed in steps of action that are very orderly. So you see the lump of wet material in verse 2. Then God turns on the power. Let there be light. And that brings heat. He brings in energy. And things start moving. And he sets up a timer. We call it day and night. To add emphasis to God's steps. We see all three components of our planet. The expanse or firmament is the atmosphere or sky. And then, of course, you have the land and you have the oceans. Energy from light and heat moves the atoms from solid to form either liquid or gas. God is forming the land. He lays out the bodies of waters. And then in proper sequence, if you look at the sequence, first there are the plants, the heavenly bodies, which is the stars, the moon, and sun, the aquatic animals, the flying creatures, land animals, and finally man. All laid out in an orderly fashion. And along the way, God creates the provision. You have three components for life. Light, air, and water. This is all laid out in verses 3 through 10. In verses 11 and 12, we have plant life. Plants need light, air, and water. If the air was heavy with carbon dioxide, which it probably was, it is best for plants, who then in turn replace it with oxygen, which is best for animals. We call this ecology and biology. So, and it, and it works. And there's a cycle where the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and the water, they all are related and plants are an important component of this as well as animals because we breathe out carbon dioxide, which benefits the plants. So, there's this symbiotic relationship between plant life and animal life. And of course, plants are created for animals to, to eat. And we also note the phrase, after its kind, for the creatures. So each animal has a specific purpose in relating to the world. Each also has a built-in adaptability. Some have greater adaptability than others. This is why you see like, an animal like a rat that can live just about anywhere. And then you have other animals that may be limited to like the cold climate, like the South Pole where you have a lot of penguins living. You don't find them in Brazil or Africa. So the last piece is the people. We're going to look at verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So, speaking of people, God created us to have his nature. 
The soul of man reflects God's goodness. The image of God is not that we look like God, but in these physical bodies, we are to live and reflect God's goodness. And we're created social. We are to reflect the triune nature of God. We have body, soul, and spirit. Three parts. We relate to God as the Father relates to the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have a built-in need to connect. That's why God created man and woman. We're social. We're designed to complement one another. So when a man and woman marry, you have a husband and a wife. And with God as the head of their household, you have another trinity. You have God, husband, and wife. We're created in status. We have a unique status. God gave dominion to mankind. We are the one entrusted to be the stewards of his creation to reflect his dominion and his glory in both as he reflects it in both heaven and earth. And we are created in purpose. We are to recreate life. That's why he says be fruitful and multiply. Let's increase our population to fill the world and steward it on behalf of God. Every child born is our connection to God as the same breath that was breathed into Adam and also breathed into Eve. We don't have the account of her being form other than God took the rib out of the side of Adam to create her. I'm sure he had to breathe life into her. So the divine breath that was in both male and female connect when a child is conceived. So we're all connected to God that way. So we, we, as we conclude with chapter one, then we go into the first two verses of chapter two. I don't know why the human editors of the Bible decided to use the first, these first two verses of Genesis chapter 2 sound like they should be kept in chapter 1. This is how they, they go. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. That's verse 3. Okay? So here, these first three verses of chapter 2 actually connect with chapter 1. But, and I say this because now God looks at everything. He's done. Man and woman have been created. They've been given their instruction. And here's the commendation. Behold, it was very good. Note that every day, every step of the way, God made the same commendation. It was very good. When there was light, it was very good. When the plants and animals were created, it was very good. Why? Because God cannot do anything less than good. The psalmist writes in 33, verse 5, In the beginning, the earth is full of goodness of the Lord. God is the measure of goodness. So in the beginning, creation was not corrupted by sin. And it was all completed. Verse 1 goes against the false philosophy of evolution. God created everything, all the hosts of them, in the beginning. Now when we talk about adaptability, what we've seen, what Charles Darwin noticed was the adaptability of certain species of birds there in the Galapagos Islands. That's what he was observing. He didn't say that. He said they just adapted or evolved in, in a sense with what we call microevolution. I call it adaptability. These animals adapt. Take a tiger, for instance. A tiger is very adaptable. Down in Java and Sumatra, you have a smaller tiger. It's a lot hotter there. Okay? So, and in a lot of the jungle environments, the animals tend to be a little smaller because of the heat. Because if you have a, the relationship of your skin or your outer to the body allows heat to be retained or kept. So if you have more body, I mean more skin than body, if you can understand the ratio, heat escapes. And in a hot environment, you want your body heat to escape so you can stay cool. In cold environments, you notice larger animals. So in Siberia, tigers get up to 600 pounds. In Sumatra and Java, they're much, much smaller. They're under 200 pounds. This is adaptability. Now, there was a moth in England that 
changed this color because people were using coal to heat their homes. So a lot of the malls over time adapted by every generation having more and more darker malls. That's how they would survive because they could hide on the, on the tops of homes away from predators and they would blend in. When they changed their heating from coal to electricity or, or propane, there was a change again. They adapted and went back to their old model color. So you might say, well, so that kind of goes against the argument of evolution. But in the beginning, I want you to know, no sin in the beginning. And it was all completed. It was all done. And if you ever ask the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It was the chicken, because God made the chicken first. And then God was contented. The seventh day is different from the previous six. Why? He completed his task. God had a task. Six days he worked on it. Seventh day he rested. He's done. It passed inspection. It was all in working in good order. That doesn't mean God didn't stop working as far as maintaining and sustaining it. But the creative part, the project, was done. So he set aside the seventh day for himself, and he blessed it. Did he stop upholding the universe? No. What makes it special is kind of like when you finish a project, and you step back, it's done. You take a rest. That is the most natural thing to do. Whether that project was to build an addition to your home, or maybe you're, you painted a portrait of something and you finished and you signed your name at the right hand corner or left hand corner, whatever artists do, and you step back and you have yourself a cup of coffee and you say, man, this is good. That's basically what God has done. That makes it special. Just like graduation day. You graduate from college or high school, and the very next day, what do we normally do? We kind of take it easy. We just accomplish something fantastic. Now, some people give this passage the full force of the law, but it's not a law. This is simply a statement. The day is not called the Sabbath until it's put in the Ten Commandments, which is given specifically to Israel. The word Sabbath is not mentioned in Genesis. A seventh-day rest is not found in Genesis after chapter 2. There's a principle here. It's a very simple principle. Work six days and rest on the seventh. Now, I'm going to make it very plain that even a child can understand, because this is how I understood it, because I was confused over the concept of a weekend, when on a calendar you see the first day of the weekend was the first day of the week on the calendar, and the last day of the week began the weekend, Saturday, yet we lump Saturday and Sunday together, and we call it the weekend. Why is it the weekend? Because it's based on the work week. The work week starts with Monday in our culture. In other cultures, it might be Tuesday. But if you follow the principle, you work six days, rest on the seventh. So for you and me, if someone comes up to you and says, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath, you can smile and say, I do. I work six days and rest on the seventh. And the seventh happens to be for you and me Sunday. What did Jesus say about the Sabbath? People were not made for the good of the Sabbath. Did you hear that? The Sabbath was made for the good of the people. It's good to rest. It's good to rest one day out of seven. The Sabbath was made for the good of the people. And then he, this is how Jesus authenticates it. So the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. In other words, he says, I'm the boss. This is how I've given the principle. This is my policy. Work six days, rest on the Sabbath. So we give honor to creation when we stop once a week and reflect upon God. This is why we go to Genesis. We read this. And we understand the awesome nature of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the culmination of creation, God said it was good. He was contented. In the beginning, without sin, 
Creation reflected the glory of God, and we were created in his image. However, sin has messed that up. Sin has ruined that. But God has promised a remake. He had a plan. He was going to send a redeemer who would take care of sin and defeat the author of sin, Satan. And it's going to happen. And it did happen on the cross where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins according to Scripture, was buried and risen from the dead, and was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses. It happened in space, time, and history. So when you open up the book of Revelation, the last book, in chapter 21, we see the new heavens and the earth as God is going to set everything right. God has a purpose and he's not going to waver from it. He created you and me for glory and we see this when God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to, to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. How do we overcome sin? We trust by Christ, in, in Christ, by faith. You turn to him. And believe the truth and reality that Jesus Christ did, in fact, die for your sin. And was buried. And is risen from the dead. The Bible says, you will be saved. Because God created you to reflect his glory. And that glory includes his love, his grace, and his mercy. And that comes with forgiveness of sins. And he says, when he forgives your sins, he remembers your sins no more. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful for this time together. Father, my prayer is that everyone within listening has trusted by faith in your Son. And for those who have not, may your Holy Spirit convict their hearts today. Convict them to the point of conviction that they know that they are sinners, that they have broken your holy law. And they know that you are God, the creator, the giver of life. May they also know and learn that through you comes eternal life by way of your Son, the one whom you sent into space, time, and history, the one who went to the cross, the one who perfectly fulfilled your law, the one who had no sin or guile in him, the one who died, saying, It is finished thereby satisfying your holy righteousness by making payment for our sins, dying in our place so that we could live with you forever. And you having raised him from the dead, we know there is life after death. My prayer is that everyone listening will enjoy that life after death with you according to your word, your will, and your purpose. May that soul as near as the gates of hell Respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and turn and receive Christ as Savior. We pray this in Jesus' most precious and holy name and all God's children say together, Amen. Be good, be blessed, and be a blessing to those of you who are watching today. Take care, and God bless.